welcome, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Andargolian. I'm the Chief of Staff at the Office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating uh, this wonderful panel today. Our panel uh, is entitled Nation Under Lockdown, Borderless Through Diaspora. So the focus of this conversation is going to be the uh, COVID era and uh, diaspora and how it relates to uh, the homeland and, uh, and all things in between. Um, my, the, it's my great pleasure to be hosting three, uh, four wonderful panelists uh, today. We have the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs, Mr. Zare Sinanyan, uh, the Republic of Armenia's um, Ambassador to the United States, Varujan Nersesyan. We have Mr. Ruben Vartanyan, uh, the social entrepreneur, impact investor, venture philanthropist, and also co-founder of uh, Idea Foundation and uh, Fast Foundation. Uh, and we have um, Ms. Nadia Gorzunian, president of AGBU Europe and UGAB France. Thank you so much uh, for spending the next hour uh, together with me. So the format, um, uh, actually, before I jump to the format, I would like to take an opportunity to thank Future Studios for hosting this Fast Foundation, for creating the space to have uh, important dialogue like this. So thank you very much, Fast and Future Studios. The format will be the following. For the first 40 minutes, I'll be getting to give the questions to our panelists. And then the last 20 minutes, we will be opening up to questions from our uh, viewers who will be uh, who will be passing those questions along uh, in the chat box. Um, for those of you who would like to listen to this in Armenian, you can click on the globe on the bottom. It's called, there's a little globe on the bottom. It says interpretation. You click on that. And in order to listen to Armenian, you need to click on Portuguese. So please do that now if you'd like to listen to it in Armenian. Uh, Okay. So uh, we're going to jump right in now. Um, I'll start with the uh, High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs, as well as my uh, close colleague, uh, Zare Sinanyan. Um, this year was meant to be a big year for the uh, Office of the High Commissioner in terms of uh, having a very full agenda to visit um, as many diaspora communities as was possible and also to invite a great number of diaspora leaders uh, to Armenia. Obviously that's been put on hold. How are, uh, how are you, how is the office reimagining a relationship with the diaspora in this COVID era? How are you keeping those connections? Um, uh, first of all, I wanna say hello to everyone, everyone who's attending this webinar. And I wanna thank the Past Foundation and Future Studios for hosting this event. Uh, and uh, as far as the question that's been posited, uh, clearly there's something to be said about personal contact, right? I mean, we, um, we get things done much better when we're face-to-face, when we're, um, we, so there's a physical aspect to building relationships. And what we do between Armenia and, and diaspora is uh, in many senses, building a relationship. Now, the COVID-19 has kind of temporarily, at least I hope, taken the physical aspect of it um, out of the formula. And we have had to adjust just like everyone else and use those means that are at our disposal, mainly technology, technological means to um, salvage many of the programs uh, or at least keep contact with our communities alive. And um, to that extent, uh, although we're unable to fulfill most of the programming planned for this year, uh, and we've been unable to physically visit diaspora and since early March, and the diaspora is clearly unable to visit Armenia, which is very unfortunate. Uh, we, have, we have been using the internet and uh, programs, you know, platforms such as uh, Zoom to move some of our uh, contacts with the diaspora online. Uh, for example, we have the um, Diaspora Connected program, 
which is uh, a substitute, at least temporary substitute, for contacts with our diasporan communities. Once or twice a week, we uh, organize, schedule a meeting with a diasporan community and get online, get on Zoom, confer, and talk about issues as if we would have talked uh, uh, about issues had we been meeting in person. Uh, again, nothing is a 100% um, substitute for personal uh, contact, but this does provide us uh, with an opportunity to keep that daily contact alive, at least, until we can fully reestablish contacts. Other programs, uh, such as IGORTS, uh, we've been able to expand in this COVID atmosphere because, for example, we are unable to host our uh, big uh, mega conferences in September, which we had uh, planned on doing three of them. And we're unable to uh, host the Kyle de Pitun program, the Young uh, Leaders Summer Camp, and other such programs. We have the funding to expand the IGORTS program, which is uh, Armenian government's first fellowship program uh, with the goal of uh, providing a fellowship and drafting, in essence, um, professionals uh, with master's degrees from uh, the diaspora and engaging them in the Armenian government. While initially we had planned on funding 20 such individuals, uh, it was clear that there was a much greater need from the Armenian government because we had in excess of 85 requests from the Armenian government for such professionals. And uh, we had a, a huge excess of applicants. We had over 800 applicants that applied for these 20 positions. So now we've, we're sort of shuffling the funds around and we're going to fund upwards of 100 fellows this year. I think uh, the influx of 100 uh, well-educated professionals from the diaspora into the Armenian governance system is going to have uh, a serious impact in the way we do things, in the way we think, and, and in the speed with which things uh, move forward. Another, you know, I know my time is still quite limited, but another uh, program that we're piloting is uh, Kyle Depitun program, but only online. Uh, we're going to do it probably in the month of August and thereby, again, provide an online platform for children to stay connected with our music since we can't do it physically, and also alleviate the horrible pressure that the parents are under because kids are home constantly and they need to be kept busy. And hopefully this is a constructive way to engage them and, and keep them out of trouble. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a perfect segue for me to uh, actually ask about online education. Um, with, and uh, bounce that question over to Ms. Gordzunian. AGBU has been very much on the forefront of, uh, of providing before COVID online education uh, tools to the diaspora. What's the, I'm curious, what, what's the extent to which COVID has pushed that further in terms of having, having your online platforms being used more often or are you perhaps providing a different kind of educational material to the diaspora in this era? Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, yes, indeed, COVID has, uh, you know, changed the, the situation. And I would like to illustrate that with uh, two examples, if you don't mind. Uh, so you are probably uh, familiar with the AGBU online learning program, the Armenian Virtual College named AVC. Uh, which was set up 10 years ago to help Armenians around the world access quality learning courses on the Armenian language for both Western and Eastern Armenian for literature, history, and related topics. This existed already 10 years ago. We added the chess included in the platform uh, a few years ago in reflection of the, the Armenian government uh, priorities. The strategic shift was already planned before COVID crisis, but the crisis has demonstrated how relevant this shift is and accelerated the implementation. So in April this year, the AVC launched the Learning Zone. This is a diversified learning experience focused on general knowledge of the Armenian world combining self-education based on daily activities with opportunities to live live communication and discussions. 
In response to the call of the Ministry of Education, Science, Culture and Sport of Armenia to expand the opportunities for online education, AVC has launched multiple editions of a free AVC learning zone. So two editions were completed already. The third, line, the third one is uh, ongoing and it's uh, already around 800 participants who benefit from this uh, free learning program. There is another uh, detail here, which is very important in terms of shif shifting the content of the e-learnings. The first step that was already set in motion before the crisis started using the AVC platform to teach business skills as part of the Empower Her project. Empower Her project is a project run by HBU Armenia that helps women entrepreneurs set up and grow their business in Armenia. Through the platform, the organization teaches a whole range of skills from MS Excel, business ethics, accounting, uh, legal, and et cetera. Beyond this also, HBU plan to provide vocational skills with the AVC platform. We hope to start with coding skills, allowing all young people in Armenia to learn coding online. And lastly, with AVC, uh, we hope uh, to be able to provide a service to ordinary school, meaning for the teachers, the Armenian teachers, uh, help them prepare the next generation in the STEM uh, subject. So this is the first example of everything which were accelerated and uh, developed uh, uh, during COVID. The second example is related to the GORIS program. We also uh, like to share this, uh, the impact of uh, uh, COVID on our way of working globally. We have put digitalization and agility from the start in our AGBU GORIS program. The GORIS Leadership Development Program is a professional level leadership program tailored for talented young Armenians, enabling them to confront and transcend the challenges of their personal, professional, community and public lives. The purpose is to create the leaders who will make a difference for the society and for the global Armenian nation. Showing leadership in uncertain times is a core of Goris. So we were well prepared for COVID due to the fact that we started building an online platform for leadership development to accompany the in-class learning with a virtual component. The creation of www.leadership.am was started beginning of 2019 after our team met with President Armin Sarkisian in Yerevan. A need for a virtual platform was articulated to bring human capital throughout the global Armenian nation together. We swiftly converted the first seminar, which was intended for April in Brussels, into launching the leadership platform for the GORIS 2020 cohort. The result was that we were able to provide high quality content on the topic of leadership to the GORIS cohort from leaders from renowned companies such as Walt Disney, Starbucks, and Vogue. Digitalization and agile end-to-end -end delivery of projects has been our strategic goal. The COVID situation has accelerated it, execution and high speed. So I welcome you to visit the leadership platform to read more about the GBU GORIS program and to be part of this online offline leadership development journey. We will hold an online webinar entitled Leading Self, Others and Organization with some of the Armenian world's luminaries, including Ruben Vartanian. Thank you, Ruben, for being part of this, but also Ari Libarikian, Ani Harajian and Armen Ovanesov. So please visit the, the site leadership.in to register. So in conclusion to your question, I think that we can say that the move towards online leadership was already underway before March 2020. The recent crisis has shown us that this movement, which we knew to be necessary, was in fact also urgent and inevitable. Hopefully AG, AGBU is in the mood of uh, achieving this like others. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll just take the opportunity to ask how the French Armenian community is doing uh, in terms of COVID. What is, uh, you know, how are you doing? How is the French Armenian? I know there are so many <clears throat> also French Armenian physicians on the front lines. Maybe you can give us a little bit of an understanding of uh, how the French Armenian community is doing. Yes, uh, thank you for asking. So overall, as you may know, France is in a good shape now because the, the peak is done for a few weeks. Uh, the, the country is open now. It's not 100% normal life, obviously. Not everybody could uh, go back to work and normal life, but we are doing better every day and it seems to be stable. Uh, we were AGBU, like other Armenian uh, diaspora um, organizations, were very worried about the situation for our people here. So we were very you know, open and in contact with a lot of people. I would say that fortunately, in terms of, I would say, medical situation, we didn't have big issues. Uh, you know that the French uh, medical situation is uh, uh, is uh, strong. People go uh, for free in hospital, and we didn't hear. Of course, we had some loss, unfortunately, but we didn't have big issue of people not being able to be treated or anything like that. So we were very uh, concentrated on the medical side, which was okay. In some of uh, smaller town, uh, not in Paris, but in uh, some other towns, some people were, of course, um, uh, implemented some help for some poor people. And we did it also in Paris, but it was more or less okay. But again, nothing really hard to say here. In fact, now we are preparing ourselves for not the, really yet the second wave of COVID, but maybe the economical impact of all this. Because yes. as everywhere, mm -hmm. we may expect some uh, work, uh, you know, uh, people losing work and having some newly economic issues. And with this, we are really, we want to be aware and to be ready to help here. So this is what we are preparing uh, in France with several other associations and especially with the, um, uh, you know, the CSAF, who is the coordinating body of all associations in France. Yes. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, let's go to the United States uh, and uh, Ambassador Nersesian, if you can give us a little bit of an idea of uh, how things are uh, there um, in the U.S. Uh, as it relates uh, to two, two topics. I think I'll just throw both out now. Uh, the perspective of the U.S. Armenian community, um, diaspora Armenians in the U.S. and COVID, as well as Maybe you can also comment in general uh, how uh, the COVID era has been, has affected uh, your work uh, as it relates to diplomacy and uh, diplomatic relations. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And uh, welcome everybody from Washington DC. I'm really glad to join this great panel and to share my perspective uh, from here, from Washington. And of course, this is very, very, uh, important times the, the COVID crisis affected us everybody and um, our embassy here in Washington uh, since the outbreak of the of the COVID has been uh, intensively uh, involved both with our community and with uh, American authorities in organizing our work in this in this uh, circumstances, in this uh, crisis situation. And this was yet another opportunity for all of us to mobilize our resources, to concentrate and to focus on our work on this, um, in, in this situation. <clears throat> um, we were uh, just before the, you know, when I talk here often, you know, to the colleagues and friends and Armenian American community members, it was, of course, we knew the news that were coming in Mar February, in March, but nobody would have expected that this was go the scale here in the United States, uh, you know, was going to be uh, to that extent. Um, we were busy and, uh, you know, uh, Armenian American community and not only Armenian American community supported us to organize a big concert here in Washington at Washington Cathedral. That was the large, last large public event that we had. And right, it was on March 1st, March 4th. And right after that, you know, uh, we discovered ourselves in a completely new mode, in a completely new situation when the 
uh, the, the pandemic started to, to spread. Uh, and our embassy organized its work in such a way that we maintained 99% of our activities, both from the office and from home, uh, uh, fulfilling our mission, both, uh, first of all, the, you know, continuing Armenian-American relations, relations, developing our daily work with American institutions, American government institutions, with executive, with the legislative, but also maintaining on a daily basis our contacts with the uh, Armenian-American community. I have been in touch with, uh, and both here and when West Coast and our Consulate General in, in West Coast has been uh, similarly involved with uh, the community and, and uh, local authorities in, in California and other states in the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> but um, I've been in touch um, on a daily basis with, uh, with the primate and the prelate and the, uh, and the diocese and prelacy and Armenian American community organizations, the leadership and the members. Members, We have organized two big conference calls with Yerevan, with the community leadership and uh, Deputy Prime Ministers uh, Avinyan and Foreign Minister Natsaganyan uh, to discuss the needs that Armenia has. Uh, and also uh, here in the United States between East Coast and West Coast leadership, our embassy and consulate general uh, in Los Angeles organized the call to see what are the needs in Armenia, what is the situation, and also what are the needs here in the community, how, to what extent the community has been affected. So we have been in close contact in this and trying to address the issues. The embassy has been also heavily involved and busy with the organization of the assistance for the return of Armenian citizens to Armenia. This has been, and, and also Consulate General from Los Angeles, we have organized uh, from East Coast uh, um, more than, you know, uh, the return uh, of more than 150 of our citizens, including 37 students and 35 children. Uh, and by the way, the children, they were, you know, this was a unique case that uh, they were <clears throat> in uh, 19 U.S. states. Uh, these were the children in the FLEX program organized by the American Councils. So we worked with the American Councils and the Georgian Embassy here in Washington. This was a good demonstration of cooperation on a concrete issue to organize the, the return of 37 children. It was very difficult. Their parents were very, you know, anxious in Armenia. And uh, we really succeeded. Uh, it was an excellent cooperation with Georgian Embassy and American Consuls and American government here to organize the return. And through uh, also the help of our honorary consul, Oscar Tatosian, in Chicago, Armenian American community, right after my call in, in, in Chicago, uh, just during several hours, got organized, went to the airport, organized everything for the children. So that was a very good example how we could mobilize our resources to return the you know, uh, 35 children to Armenia. Uh, <clears throat> but also many other projects that they've been, we, we have been busy, um, you know, students from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy uh, from Iowa, several groups of student, students that we have assisted, we have tried, and our Consul General in Los Angeles has assisted in return of 350, more than 350 citizens of the Republic of Armenia. So this has been a part of, a, uh, only a small part of our activities, but also uh, we have been uh, engaged with American authorities, as I said, in the organization of the <clears throat> American assistance projects to the Republic of Armenia. And of course, we're thankful for the uh, more than 5.4 million uh, US dollars worth assistance pro program post COVID that was allocated generously by the US government to Armenia. So uh, this was yet another demonstration of American generosity and extending the, uh, you know, helping hand to Armenia in the middle of this crisis. Uh, along with that, of, of course, the embassy has participated uh, and has done its own contribution to the very beautiful initiative of the Armenian American community of reaching out to the American families uh, in need in this COVID situation. Uh, that was allocation of meals uh, that originally the intent was 1.5 million symbolic number coinciding with the number of Armenian genocide victims, but then it reached more than 6.5 million, if I'm not mistaken. 
So the embassy uh, around April 24th has contributed and, and called on upon the community to actively participate in this wonderful initiative uh, to, to you know, also demonstrate Armenian American communities, uh, you know, gratitude towards the American people and the American government uh, to reach out as, uh, as Armenian community here in the United States. So these were the most of the uh, priorities we have been uh, involved. But of course, this is a very challenging situation for us, talking about today's topic, nation under lockdown, borderless through diaspora. I think uh, we have as Armenian people, as Armenian government and Armenian uh, diaspora to do this analysis. And I thank you for this good opportunity to talk between ourselves. What are our tasks? What are we facing? What are the challenges? Armenia is in the middle of very difficult times these days. The government is doing its utmost to, to address the situation and to, uh, you know, to overcome as soon as possible the, the crisis and to address the, the economic impact, the economic uh, tasks that are deriving. So we have, as and, and this was a, also a chance for us to mobilize, like during the time of the Armenian, the earthquake, Spitak earthquake in Armenia, or during the time of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, the diaspora immediately started to channel its assistance to Armenia. And I thank particularly here for, to Armenian American community and all our diaspora communities that have not hesitated for a second. I'm sure Commissioner <clears throat> Mr. Sinanyan has the entire data and, and the, you know, of the situation and of the diaspora's help to Armenia during this situation. But this is an opportunity. We got to look at this as Prime Minister Pashinyan suggests, not an, only as a challenge, this virus, the, the, the coronavirus crisis, but also as an opportunity for Armenia diaspora situation, for Armenia diaspora. We have worldwide diasporans that have the accumulated experience, the institutional memory, accumulated. So we can utilize this through and including through this conference calls. We discovered ourselves in the world. Uh, I, for instance, didn't know before the coronavirus that the Zoom conferences would have allowed us this opportunity to meet right during several hours. You can schedule, you meet online, you do the you know, discussions. It's very effective, by the way. Of course, this cannot substitute to the face-to-face -face meetings, especially in diplomacy. This is very challenging for diplomats to, co to conduct their daily activity because diplomacy has its own nuances, has its own sensitivities, the issues of confidentiality, but uh, we somehow got adapted to this. So uh, the, the, for the Armenia and this diaspora, this is a new opportunity as well to try to do as uh, the commissioner just explained. So um, most of the projects luckily didn't suffer. We continue these things online. We continue these things through uh, Zoom conferences. So we, we, we need to understand how we can do, because we don't know how long this is going to continue. We wish, so, of course, yeah. that our yeah. compatriot Nubar Afeyan's Moderna company registers the <laughs> quickest and uh, the most successful, you know, becomes the most successful uh, vaccine and, and uh, you know, helps the people here in America and worldwide and, and our compatriots. But we don't know how long this situation is going to continue. Uh, therefore, we need to adapt a long-term strategy, uh, how to organize Armenia, diaspora, Artsakh, uh, worldwide, our communities in the situation of crisis. And I, by crisis, I don't mean only pandemic. It seems the world has entered the dangerous water of uh, all kinds of crises, be it international, <clears throat> international tensions, be it uh, conflicts, that unfortunately these days we're witnessing in our neighboring uh, regions uh, the, the evolution of certain conflicts that, that are concerning us. So <clears throat> we need to organize our lives in these new conditions. And I think this is a very good opportunity to discuss. The technology is only one aspect, but we need to think of what else we can do so that our Armenia diaspora community activities do not suffer. This is a challenge. But the, more important challenge is, you know, how we're going to organize diaspora's involvement and engagement, and not only help, but engagement in Armenia post-COVID. How, uh, you know, in the light of the absence of flights, in the light of the 
absence of normal communications that existed before the pandemic, how we are going to organize all of this. Armenia is going to be in need of, a, you know, post-COVID rehabilitation, and we need to address this challenge, how to better organize. So with this, thank I would you. like to conclude, but I would be happy to engage in the question and answer. And I thank all of the panelists. Thank you. I'm looking forward thank you, to this. Thank you, Ambassador. It's, 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 thank you. It's a perfect uh, opportunity to um, move to Ruben Vartanian as we're discussing uh, sort of post-COVID re rehabilitation. Uh, Ruben, as I was preparing for this um, webinar, I was looking again at all of the work um, Idea Foundation has done in the country and, and the incredible uh, work, especially as it relates to tourism infrastructure uh, that has been done um, uh, down south and Dilijan, Gyumri, all over. How are you thinking about the uh, socioeconomic projects, the uh, social uh, entrepreneurship projects that uh, you have undertaken in the country in this post-COVID era? Is there, can we think about this as an opportunity? How are you thinking about it? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Good evening, everybody. By Ireko uh, We are connecting different part of the world and uh, really it's amazing to use this technology opportunity to talk with the people in different part of the world. I was Tamada, one of the way, online wedding. And it was a funny experience when I've been managing 200 people sitting in online in 18 countries and we've been talking to toast and trying to celebrate the wedding which people decide not to postpone because they've been already organizing it, everything in a way. <clears throat> it was interesting to see the plus and minus of the technology. <clears throat> but coming back to your point, I think it's um, <clears throat> very challenging for not only tourists, but for small countries in general, because we are looking at what's happening now in a post-COVID world, the countries with self-sustainability becoming more <clears throat> attractive because you can see the big countries benefiting to be enough big to keep their own activities in uh, internal tourism or uh, economic development without being dependent from export or import. That's why I think for all small countries, not only for Armenia, and you know, in our research that we've been doing the last 20 years, we always use Armenia as like uh, example for other countries because no, Armenia not alone. We have a worldwide around 35 countries our size who are facing some similar challenges about how to be attractive for donors, how to be attractive for investors, how to make tourism or whatever other industry development uh, proper to be attractive for the uh, big flow of the money or people or projects. And I think the COVID pushed us in the instinct um, situation. In one hand, we've been more isolated and we've been now sitting more in our own homes and we are not only cannot leave our own country, but most of the people have been sitting in our flight. At the same time, our connectivity to the world become better. That's why it is instinct uh, <clears throat> situation when in one hand you are fully Isolated, in the other hand, you are connected to the world and your dependability from the world become much better because um, before you've been hearing the news about what's happening in China or what's happening in uh, Russia or United States, more like from curiosity. Now it becomes more relevant to your own life. That's why I think the relevance of the global connectivity increased dramatically despite our <laughs> capacity to travel increased in my view. Um, I mean, by the way, you need to know most of our projects, which we've been doing in Armenia the last 20 years, this year we will be celebrating Armenia 2020 project 20 years, but we started with Nubar in uh, February 2001. We always had a 35, 40% internal tourism. And so I say also it's interesting for Tate, for example, or Dilijan, it's benefit from becoming attractive, not only for external, but also internal people to travel to see certain places. And the same in Artsakh, what we've been doing, or in Gyumri, is the idea to make a lot of things not only for outside people coming to Armenia, but also inside of Armenia to using this uh, infrastructure. I'll say uh, overall, we will, I think, face, we will face uh, some challenges of the recovery of the tourist industry long, quite long. Uh, in the future, it will take much longer time than we expect. Uh, I think it will be two or three years before it will be fully recovered. So I would need to be ready and uh, be realistic about our capacity to operate without the same flow of people who've been coming to Armenia, especially the last couple of years. And we need to be realistic about overall the travel, travel will become less active overall because people will be scared, it will take more difficult, more 
a little more complicated to travel. So I, I think it's uh, <clears throat> in one hand giving more opportunity to build your own ecosystem internally and to do some projects. Um, also giving you a chance to use the network of uh, companies and people operating worldwide using the online technology. But I think it's a reality will be not simple for Armenia for the next uh, couple of years. I think it will be quite challenging to uh, keep the same growth of the people who can be coming to Armenia because of the connections with the diaspora connection or just tourist interest to Armenia. But um, the same time, I believe what we've been doing in uh, with FAST, with the Tourism Urban Development Foundation, with the Aurora, with all the elements, I can see the more and more interest from young Armenians to be engaged more to the Armenian world. And we need to use this momentum also to better explain our uniqueness. One thing I want to share, which is not relevant to your question, but I think it's very important. I looked the numbers before I was meeting and I found now instinct uh, correlations why Armenian diaspora been also so uh, very well known in the world and how we, why it was so relative to others was more important or always more uh, people will talk about us. And I'll tell you the numbers. It's uh, overall we're living 7.8 billion people living in the planet and Armenians only 10 million. But if you diaspora, more or less people calculating is around half a billion maximum, realistically 200 million. And we're talking about five to eight million Armenian diaspora. It's why from diaspora point of view, Armenians diaspora, for example, the Chinese or Indian diaspora is a 50 million people, uh, Russian diaspora 25 million people. It's why our re relevance to the list number is much higher compared to relevance to the overall global population. It's the same if you look there historically in, in our book that we wrote with Nune Ali Khan and with the Nubara Piana Crossroads. Historically, Armenian population in the first century BC and after <clears throat> was around 10 million. Whereas the Mediterranean people was living in this area was 200 million people. It's by basically we've been relevantly the same 200 million to 10 million, like now diaspora to uh, other diasporas. That's why I think we can benefit from this. We can really use our long expertise and, 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 and uh, knowledge about how to organize so much better than many others. So I think it will be good to us to use this momentum to share, to show the best uh, example how we can use this, uh, maximize the efficiency of the network. Very good. Thank you so much, Ruben. Um, you know, I, I have a bunch of other questions as well, but I'm seeing so many questions also here in the chat from our uh, members of the audience. So maybe rather than ask my questions, I'm gonna go over here and read the uh, chat, um, chat questions. Uh, and I'll just use the last one since it's about tourism and it's specifically to Ruben. Uh, the question is, Mr. Vartanian, how long do you think, oops, how long do you think the recovery, how long do you think it'll take to recover in the tourism sphere? I don't know, it depends how deep will be the crisis. We, nobody knows what yeah. will happen with that. And we just need to understand, we will live in new reality. It's not about the crisis and then when the crisis will be recovered. We are living in new realities. The online will become a bigger part of our life. I think we need to be also realistic with the economic uh, <clears throat> crisis not starting yet. We don't see yet what's happening uh, after this three months of shutting down your country economy. So I will say it needs to be careful about any predictions. We need to be careful about any uh, rosy expectation. Everything will come back very quickly. In spite we see, we saw already in the US market, stock market, for example, recovered was quite quickly and the oil price went back quite quickly. But I think it's more like waves, which will go down again because we can see social instability. We can see the more and more um, serious results coming out of the big corporation losing money and big uh, challenges facing in different parts of the world and I think the social instability and uh, political instability will grow up. So I, I will be quite cautious about being very optimistic about recovery uh, timing and uh, I will say we used to okay. be expecting like a couple of years at least. Okay, all right, that's fair. Um, uh, I'm going to just pick some of these questions because there's way too many here, but um, uh, maybe this is for everyone, but perhaps specifically 
uh, to the High Commissioner as well as the Ambassador. Could you talk a little bit about some key successes uh, for the U.S. diaspora in fighting against the current situation? Uh, maybe some examples of successes where diaspora uh, has uh, marked some success, as well as any challenges that you want to talk about in particular diaspora communities. Uh, you know, one thing that's very particular about this crisis that was not in place during the previous uh, crises that the uh, crises that uh, Armenia has undergone, you know, uh, at the Artsakh war and the earthquake is that the entire world is in crisis. So it's not that Armenia is in crisis and the diaspora is doing relatively well and, and they can step in at any time. The diaspora, uh, because this is a worldwide phenomenon, is also experiencing this in some way or form. In fact, some of our communities are experiencing a far worse crisis than what we're experiencing in Armenia. For example, our brethren and our sisters in Lebanon have multiple layers of crisis that they're undergoing. An economic crisis that started before the pandemic, that's been intensified by the pandemic, uh, added on to economic um, crisis that's going to come as a result of the pandemic, as well as new U.S. sanctions on Syria and its supporters and so on. So uh, that I just gave you one example. Like we can talk about the Iranian Armenian community. I think we're going to uh, see our communities, even in Russia, being impacted by this economic downturn. Like, uh, uh, like Ruben Vartanian already mentioned, we're on the beginning end of, you know, we're at the start point of the economic crisis. We haven't really seen it. Uh, it's going to be long. It's going to be very harsh. It's going to impact the world and our community. So we have to be mindful about and, and measure our, our expectations from the diaspora. We have to be in the mindset that perhaps this is a time when we need to think about helping many of these communities, as opposed to constantly expect that the diaspora is going to come to Armenia's rescue. We may be in the role of the rescuer for the next um, indefinite future. Having said that, uh, we do have successes. I mean, we have uh, our communities that have uh, mobilized to raise uh, protective equipment and have shipped them to Armenia. Specifically, Sarah, you're very well aware about our LA doctors who, on, during the very first days of the pandemic, put together an entire metric ton of uh, PPEs that at the time when they were very needed, and they were very short supply in Armenia. And literally within a week's time, uh, we received that shipment, which made a difference in the beginning stages of the pandemic. We have our foundations, uh, Yulbenkian, uh, Tupenkian, Izmirlian, the uh, our Argentinian community, part of our Argentinian community that uh, mobilized funds, again, during the period when we were in bad need of uh, equipment, uh, protective equipment, and made many of the uh, purchases that the Armenian government made in China for the weekly flights to Armenia possible. So we've had the diaspora step in despite its own uh, serious difficulties. And I think as time goes on, there's going to be a lot of work to do. We have to be measured. We have to understand that this is a marathon. It's not a, it's not a short distance race. And we have to temper uh, the way we utilize diaspora's resources because I think we're going to need that help in the long term. And therefore, we have to use it also very consciously, knowing that it's finite, that it's limited. And in fact, we should think of ourselves as the one that needs to be in the role of supporting some diaspora communities. I want to make a, a quick comment about the internal tourism uh, that was mentioned. You know, I've, I've had the fortune of uh, traveling to Armenia in the last uh, few weeks, again, uh, weekend trips. And it's nice to see that our people are internally traveling. I mean, folks aren't cooped up in their cities. They're not cooped up in Yerevan. They are going out on the weekends. They are traveling. Um, ironically, the hotels in Yerevan are virtually empty. They're servicing the uh, medical teams and the COVID patients, but otherwise no tourists. The, tour, the, the hotels outside of Yerevan are actually busy. So they're getting business. And 
I jokingly say that finally the Armenian people are getting the opportunity to get to know their own homeland, you know, people who actually reside in Armenia. Um, obviously, you know, I say that in jest, but there is some truth to that. Very good. Uh, yes, I just wanted to also add, since I was involved in that PPE, um, those PPE shipments, I will say that we have, uh, as a country, never had a shortage of PPEs. Uh, unlike a lot of the other, a lot of other countries, we haven't had a shortage, be, and a lot of that is also due to our diaspora brothers and sisters who jumped in very early and very fast. Um, Ms. Gordunian, did you have your hand up? Did you want to add something to that, or yep, maybe to you and then to the ambassador? Yeah, ju just it was a, a, a remark and a comment to Mr. Uh, Sinanian, uh, just to say that in fact, um, as you said, all diaspora are not in the same situation. Europe, for example, is not, uh, has not the financial potential of the US. Uh, on the other side, Europe is in a quite good shape, whether vis-a-vis -vis COVID and also in general. So I just want to, to emphasize that uh, if I may speak about the uh, European diaspora, that we are really eager to increase, again, our contribution and collaboration with Armenia. We have a lot of young people in Europe a lot of them, by the way, recently coming from Armenia between 20 years ago. And those people are really committed, you know, to give back to, to, and to partner with, uh, uh, with Armenia. So I guess, again, maybe it's not uh, that financial side, but uh, Europe has a lot of uh, human potential to give and to support Armenia. This is kind of the a lot of projects that we are developing in Europe together with the AGBU Armenia are related to this transfer of know-how from Europe uh, to Armenia, to this partnering and uh, you know, supporting uh, the development of Armenia. This is really important. So please uh, ask us for more. We can do better, definitely. Thank you. And, and you know what? I, I was remiss in uh, not mentioning one of the major contributors to the purchases of the PPEs and payment of the flights from China. And that, of course, is the AGBU. They were a major, major contributor of the funding, at least the funding that we raised for these purchases. So, yes, and I want to thank AGBU particularly because they've been with us every step of the way. We're very grateful for what they do, and I'm sure we'll do great things in the future, not just financially, but also using the human potential which is uh, enormous in the diaspora and uh, also um, enormously underused, under uh, deployed and undervalued in Armenia, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah. Sara, you wanted me to comment? Did, did you want to comment? In yes, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, just briefly, I think Mr. Sinanian covered most of the ground about Armenian American community, and indeed, I, I fully agree that you know our communities, particularly in the West Coast and also here in East Coast, immediately you know reacted to the situation in Armenia, tried to you know uh, you know with their with their assistance projects immediately reach out, and all of the organizations, of course, Mr. Sinanian mentioned, I fully agree with AGBUs role in all other organizations. I participated uh, on a weekly basis in a phone calls organized by Armenian uh, health professionals organization, which is a very good network of Armenian medics that it, they reached out, for instance, upon our call here at the embassy, all those Armenian citizens and non-Armenian citizens, of course, Armenian American community members uh, who had some medical health problem, health issues. So they immediately this was a good example for us because these people they don't you know charge anything they just you know upon our call they reach out any armenian who indicates us they're about healthcare needs and they they tried here also to help and uh <clears throat> there were many other examples as i said the great example of the armenian american community as a success story reaching out the american people because uh, you know, those families in need, because we have never viewed this as a one-way street. Of course, the U.S. has been a great supporter, one of the greatest supporters since Armenia's independence and sovereignty uh, for the, you know, developing the country, deepening democracy and, uh, you know, uh, low, uh, good government. Uh, but also we as Armenian people and the Republic of Armenia and Armenian American community did our best to reach out to people 
in need here. There was a success story. I believe the meals projects here, it was one of the success stories. But uh, overall, I think, yeah, our community, and I also agree with Mr. Sinanyan that we need to be equally sensitive and attentive towards all those communities, such as our community in Lebanon or in other Middle Eastern communities. We cannot differentiate because our needs are the community, these are our same people, be it in Armenia, in Los Angeles, Australia, Lebanon, Kazakhstan, or Russia. They're all Armenian people, and we need, in this time of pandemic, to ensure our mechanisms, our national institutions, that we take care about the needs of all these communities worldwide, whatever they are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I, I just wanted to also uh, note that um, recently I was in, in touch with your, um, uh, the Foreign Ministry's press secretary. I was just curious to know how many people we have brought back to the country uh, since COVID. And it's upwards of 30,000 people, 36,000 people have been organized to return to the country. And uh, that's quite a, you know, quite a feat uh, for, for two, two and a half months uh, that the Republic of Armenia has done. So. I, I just wanted to put that number out there so people know the number of people that have been brought back. Yes, absolutely. Foreign Minister Minat Sakanyan and Deputy Minister Avet Adont have been frequently, and also uh, Press Secretary Anna Nahdalian have been frequently uh, communicating with our press about this information. Uh, Armenian embassies worldwide and the Foreign Ministry has been, uh, you know, uh, concentrated and mobilized all our forces to cope with the crisis and uh, assist our citizens in return, as you mentioned. Uh, more than 35,000 citizens of the Republic of Armenia have been returned to our assistance. And uh, we're happy that we succeeded in most of these cases. Thank you. Um, did anybody want to comment on that? Because actually, I, th I think I'm going to use that opportunity to come back uh, perhaps to the High Commissioner since we have 30, 30 some odd thousand people returning to the country. Is COVID perhaps an opportunity to repa for repatriation or is it a hindrance to repatriation? I want to put that out there as well, whoever would like to talk about it, but maybe first to uh, the High Commissioner. No, uh, obviously we'd rather have it didn't happen. <laughs> your connection is bad. Uh, oh. Mr. Mr. Sinanyan, you're, you're, there's a, some kind of a sound in your connection. Maybe try again. I'll go to another speaker until things get fixed here. Some, some kind of a speaker. Okay, perhaps anyone um, would like to talk about perhaps repatriation? I see Ruben unmuted himself. Yeah, and I think we need to <clears throat> seriously talk about this because repatriation without job creation is useless. We already knew about this and we were we unemployment in Armenia before 25% we have official unemployment, where also our productivity two and a half times lower compared to Eastern European countries, which means if we increase our productivity will more unemployment. It will not do structural reforms and will not do <clears throat> serious um, re re revisiting the entire strategy of the country, what kind of industry we want to develop, what kind of the job creation we can see in <clears throat> the future potential of Armenia <clears throat> in the 21st century. I think it will be very dangerous to have a wave of repatriation, people coming and not finding job and living again. We all know the, how many Syrians Armenian came to Armenia, how many may left. And what's happening is why I think it uh, needs to be very good, well coordinated between the different uh, elements of the doing because just bringing back, back, back people without creating jobs does not make sense. In my view. The other point I want to mention for all of our discussion, and I think the High Commission know very well, we're talking about different number from 5 million Armenian diaspora to 7 million Armenian diaspora. When we did our surveys and we were doing our work with Aurora and others, we, can, we made the surveys where they found very interesting numbers, which again, not fully scientifically said, confirmed, but less of 1 million Armenians been in Armenia at least once, which means 4 million Armenians never been in Armenia. When we're talking about Armenian diaspora, we are talking about very different type of people, people who live in Iran, they're not considered a diaspora, they live in their own country, they believe Iranian Armenians and they're living in the community, which they, is their motherland, they're not considered so they're living in Armenian territory, like in Georgian Armenia, they're very uh, <clears throat> difficult to uh, confirm with their diaspora coming back from where, where it's their home. It's why we need to be look more, I mean, complex, uh, more complex way about diaspora, where is that, which kind of diaspora talking about, who is coming back, 
and who is living in Armenia and what is the flow will be with this different group of people, uh, young, old, we're talking about the repatriates of the old people retiring and coming back to their own mother and we're talking about young people to see their career development in Armenia or not. I think it's very lot of discussion. This is why we created a future studio, which you are part of the discussion, which is why we're doing the discussion about the future of Armenia 2041, which will be next step of the looking the 20 years ahead about uh, what kind of Armenian Armenian world we can see it. I think also one more point I want to mention, we're talking about numbers and it's a, it's a quite challenging because we don't know all numbers uh, correctly, but we're talking about overall the wealth of Armenian nation is around $200 billion, more or less. We should talk about, again, it's all not something to talk with Armenian <coughs> country with around $12 billion GDP. We're talking how much money we can uh, concentrate for some of the, our project and how much we can raise money for different things which we want to do it. And I think it's also, it's a penis compared to what we are achieving now, compared to what we need to be, we can do it. And it's a question also what we're not doing right together, the aspirant institutions with the government and how we can do it better. I think it's become a very critical question, especially in a crisis time. Especially what we're talking about is social instability, especially what's happening now in the US or happening can happen in other parts of the world. Where these people will move again? It will go back to Armenia or go from US to Canada or to Uruguay. I think it's a waves of the, the people that when left Lebanon, they didn't come to Armenia in the 75 war, they went to the Canada, to France, and it was the big wave of our US, and this was a big wave of people going again the new countries. So I, I think it's a crisis push us, I think, in a more serious discussion and also actions which needs to be done jointly to be sure we can really respond to this um, type of situation without a clear answer, what we're offering, what we can really do together, how we can help from diaspora to Armenia, how, like Mr. Ambassador said, also the, correctly, how Armenia can help the diasporans because it needs to be mutual, dual street uh, type of the approach, not the only one direction. But I think it's all things, I think it's crisis, the good part of the good news about the crisis is pushing all of us to become more concentrate about these issues and try to find answers quickly and not just talking in general about this. So I hope it will create more opportunities for discussion and decisions and internally in Armenia, but also outside of uh, Armenia. And um, I think we are facing interesting time for consider seriously about the future of Armenian nation in a new reality. The good news for all of us, and I think it was Nadia mentioned, I think the money becoming less important, the human capital, the human talent becoming more and more critical. Uh, it's a cost of entry to the business went down from the last 20 years from $5 million to $500,000 500, because the capex is less important anymore. So I think it's giving opportunity for many Armenians to become again very valuable to creating new uh, add value uh, in different areas of the businesses, which we can really benefit to combining people that need to move fully into Armenia, but they can coordinate and cooperate again. So I will say it's interesting uh, timing for all of us to talk about this. I think not in one hour, but more open and more serious with different group of people. That will happen. Yeah, excellent. Yes, you reminded me um, uh, during the middle of the crisis, a young person on Facebook sent me a link about, um, about how all these various companies are moving towards uh, working from home. And his point was to me saying, isn't this the perfect way to repatriate people? let them work for the companies they were working for, but live in Armenia, right? And so there was this, there, there's this kind of conversation going on where people are sending us these ideas yes. and these links. I can right? bring you a good example, Sarah. I can bring a good example. I win, I am an investor in a company named VCV, which is doing human resource review in online. The owner of the company moved to Armenia and he has a branches in Japan and US and in Russia. And he operating from Armenia now saying, why I need to be any part of this? Country, I can operate from Armenia. He, he bought the house and moved the, his headquarters to Armenia now because he can manage us all with all time differences, all the challenges based in Armenia, of course. Exactly, exactly. And uh, so, so maybe in a sense, that is a bit of a silver lining of COVID. If, uh, you know, if, P, if it doesn't matter where you're working from, uh, then what better place to do it uh, than Armenia? Uh, shall we go back to you, Mr. Sinanyan, on the repatriation mm -hmm. question? Can you hear me this now? Can you hear me now or is it still? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's better. So, uh, you know, I, I love the uh, Ruben Vartanian's response. I, you know, I can only add on to it because it's, it's pretty much gave a pretty comprehensive picture of uh, where we're at, what, what we mean by repatriation. You know, unfortunately, 
a lot of folks have this linear kind of one dimensional uh, conception of repatriation. Okay, they bring the physical human being to Armenia, but then what? And then what? Uh, without the jobs, without the infrastructure, without the educational infrastructure for folks that are coming here with, these are real people. These are real people with families, with children. You need to tend to their needs. We, we currently, we don't have the infrastructure to absorb a large number of repatriates. So to talk about repatriation, to plan for repatriation is, is a task that's going to take some serious work, serious consideration. Uh, you know, just recently, some uh, political circles associated with the old government had written that the, the High Commissioner's Office has given up on the idea of repatriation. Nothing could be further from the truth. What we've said is that we want to work on the infrastructure for repatriation. We want to have a concept of repatriation that's lasting, that's meant to keep people in Armenia, and not to bring them here and then have them move on to the third country. It's very unproductive. You need a legal infrastructure. You need the economic infrastructure. Jobs, jobs, jobs. It's all about the jobs. You need the, the, even the cultural, educational infrastructure. You need people in Armenia to be mentally prepared for an influx of a large number of people that may be somewhat different from them. What COVID has done, as has been stated, is perhaps we're not seeing it yet, but I think we will, accelerated this conversation. Because we may be facing waves of uh, repatriation or at least an influx of people from the diaspora to Armenia, that is not according to our plans. I mean, if frankly, if the economic situation in Russia deteriorates, a lot of folks who had moved there in the last 20 years may have no better choice than to come back to Armenia. The goal is how do you keep them there? How do you settle them there? What are our long-term plans? What are the resources we're willing to contribute to it? How fast can we develop the industry, the economy to absorb these waves? And I'm using Russia just as one example. Again, we mentioned Lebanon, Iran. These are crises that have been ongoing and we are on the cusp of something happening there too. So in other words, um, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's unfortunate that it's happening, COVID is happening. And it's certainly going to, it's depriving us of the financial means that we would otherwise have to perhaps deal with some aspects of um, repatriation, but also going to force us to face this issue and I think have a more serious and more sincere commitment to repatriation. We'll see. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's already 9 p.m. Uh, Ambassador Nersesian, I see you unmuted yourself. Did you want to comment? Uh, just briefly, I think uh, Ruben Please. and, and Zara, they, they spoke about this uh, issue extensively, and I don't have much to add, but I fully agree that repatriation is not a, you know, very simple business to organize. Uh, but it's, of course, the return, it, it, they're welcomed. Our, these are our brothers and sisters, the 35 thousand people have returned or prior the wave of the repatriation that uh, our uh, brothers and sisters from Syrian Ar Armenian community who returned. This was the prior wave uh, prior to even pandemic that happened. And we were happy to discover that they changed a lot. They brought a lot of fresh air into Armenians uh, reality, into Armenian society. And definitely the, this new wave uh, that are, that is forced by COVID is going to bring a change as well. But the challenge is not this type of the challenge is, of course, the long term uh, economic issue is the uh, is the social economic because otherwise it can become a challenge if we don't find jobs for them. It can become a source of a social tension of all kinds of, you know, societal issues. So we need to to, to rapidly address this issue as Armenia as as diaspora. This is an opportunity to organize the a better in a better and structured way uh, repatriation because repatriation is a fundamental issue for our country we should bear in mind that the success stories of soviet armenia has to do largely also with the repatriation of 1945 and other waves of repatriation when our uh, brothers and sisters from you know middle eastern countries from greece from european countries repatriated to armenia and uh, you know contributed to the modernization of armenia this was a huge boost, and this was a difference many 
uh, people from Soviet Union were discovering when they were tra traveling to Armenia during those times. And in modern times as well, repatriation is a big, big opportunity for a development, a leapfrog development for Armenia. But we need to address this issue in a very systematic way. We cannot afford people coming in Armenia and returning in, in desperation or disappointment. We need to make them happy. We need to create them opportunities for young people, especially to find themselves in Armenia, not only spending a nice time around op opera or in uh, Northern Avenue, but also uh, finding good jobs, educational opportunities, culturally expressing themselves for so that for our diaspora, Armenian American community, uh, diaspora community members, they discover themselves and realize their, their life uh, dreams in Armenia. So this is what we need. Uh, but of course, a, a systematic approach, creation of jobs and economic opportunities. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sarah. I know we are over our time and I don't want to steal time from Nadia, but I want to okay. offer Zare something which maybe would be good, useful to calculate not how many people repatriate, but how many companies headquarters in moved to Armenia with better numbers for you to look. The other thing I think we'll, we need to look from $2 billion for average coming annually to Armenia from repatriate money, how much money was went to investment, how much money was used for the just providing the food and and uh, life uh, stability to the families. I think this is will be important. How we can convert this $2 billion annually coming to Armenia? Not only will go down because of the crisis or all that, but how to convert this $2 billion, at least half a billion dollar, will go to investment, not to the wedding and baptizing kids and funerals. Because I think one of the biggest challenges we've been facing the was diaspora Armenian relationship with the most of the money was going to the like I said, I'm sorry to use the word toilet because we, we were eating and using for not reproducing the ad value, but more. And so I, the challenge is creating the job, converting the money from eating to investment and how bring the headquarters of the businesses to Armenia, what needs to be done. If, if I can add uh, something onto that, you know, uh, those countries that have a proven record of uh, repatriation or proven record of uh, bringing um, their ethnic brethren to their countries, you know, for example, Israel, uh, have heavily engaged um, private foundations, uh, non-governmental entities. Uh, and these entities are the ones that have, have really been instrumental in uh, making repatriation possible. Um, of course, there's a major component of the government sort of giving, um, doing everything else, uh, not necessarily coming up with the money, but uh, and probably providing the, the sort of the political motivation for it. But um, it, there's a great role to be played by non-governmental entities, diaspora organizations that may be ideologically interested in repatriation and uh, making this possible. Because I think realistically speaking, A, some things are better done by the, the private sector, even the nonprofits of the private sector. And B, uh, Armenia may not have the, the means to do the volume and the quality of uh, repatriation related work that needs to be done in, in the coming future. Very good. Well, uh, this has been an easy panel to uh, moderate since, uh, since the people, uh, the panelists have been um, so full of interesting ideas and feedback. There are many, many, many questions and comments we simply didn't get to. So my apologies to our global audience, our global listeners, that we just didn't get to your comments and questions. I will note that looking at it, I see how diverse it is. People from St. Petersburg and Canada and Houston, Texas is saying hello. And um, I'm sure if I scroll up, there are many, many other places where our um, uh, brothers and sisters in the diaspora are saying hello to us. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. Uh, Varujan Nersisyan, Ruben Vartanyan, Nadia Gorzunyan, Zare Sinanyan. Thank you, FAST. Uh, thank you, Future Studios. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And thank, thank you. you thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.